Hallelujah, we thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, we praise you, Lord, for being worthy of all the glory and the honor. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us here, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us to be here, Lord. Now, bless this word, solo dear glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I would be remiss if I did not thank all who helped for the homegoing service of our young friend and neighbor, Altariq. We praise God for all that you did. Uh, there were about 250 young people here, and they were blessed, and someone came to Christ, and that was wonderful. And so we just praise God for your hospitality, your generosity, and your love. Amen. Amen. Hello to First Lady. She's watching virtually. Hey, baby, how you doing? Amen. And praise God. I want to call your attention to Isaiah 43. If you have your Bible, I prefer you read it from your Bible, as is our practice, if you'd stand to your feet for Isaiah 43. Great to see each of you. Don't forget Bible study this Tuesday at 7 p.m. Amen. We're getting ready to look at the church known as Laodicea. Why don't you say that? Laodicea. And I want to see you there at 7 p.m. on Tuesday for Bible study. Amen. We're turning now to Isaiah chapter 43. If you have your Bible, I prefer that you go to your Bible as I'm going to read more extensively than I have thought. Because its context is so significant. This is the prophet and the poet Isaiah in chapter Isaiah 43. Amen. When you've got it, say, I've got it. Amen. When you've got it, say, I've got it. Amen. I didn't want to rush it. Isaiah chapter 43. I'll begin reading at verse 14. Verse 14 opens like this. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel... For your sake, I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea. A path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and the horses, the army and the reinforcements together. And they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I'm going to do a new thing. Now it springs up. Do not, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls. Amen. Do me a favor and just say to a few people, envisioning. Come on, say that word, envisioning. You know, you got to say it, envisioning, envisioning. If they don't say it to you, just say it to them, envisioning, 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 envisioning. Amen. It's the practice to vision. Amen. To see vision. Amen. And praise God. You may be seated. Amen. In the house of the Lord. God, again, we just pause because we want to thank you for being here. And we want to announce and declare that we're relying on your spirit to make this word clear, to plant a seed in our heart that will grow into a deeply rooted tree by the streams of water. To plant a seed in our heart that will be so significant that it will change the way we see life. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was a dark day, not just outside, but especially in the courtroom. Because there was Green Beret Joe Cerna. Joe Cerna last year was standing in the courtroom. Here he was getting ready to be sentenced. He was getting ready to be sentenced, but Joe Cerner was respected. He had done three tours of duty. He had a purple heart and many other rewards and medals. But now he's getting ready to be sentenced. The guidelines are clear, and the judge, Lou Oliveira, had to sentence him. He didn't have a say. He didn't have a choice. He had to sentence him because... Joe Cerner had been through three tours, and in those tours of duty, in that deployment, he had experienced wounds from war. 
He had been bruised by battle. He had been fractured by the fights. And can I just pause for a moment and tell you, when you go through a fight, there will be some bruises and there will be some hurt. But what Brother Cernan was doing is he was self-medicating. He was self-medicating his wounds and consequently that broke his probation. So now he was getting ready to be sentenced. He was getting ready to suffer the consequence for his wrong, but he was so respected. People knew what he had done for this country. People knew that he was a veteran. People knew that he was a Green Beret hero, and he's getting ready to be sentenced. And can I pause and talk to you for a moment? Because in our text, the people of Israel are literally being sentenced. That was Isaiah's role. Isaiah's role was to tell them that God was not pleased with some things, that God was not pleased with some things and consequently there would be some correction there'd be some okay y'all not feeling me amen my father my father don't worry i won't stay here long my father i'll never forget he was a disciplinarian now he didn't spank you a lot but he would let you know in advance what things would result in a spanking and if you ever got a spanking you would remember it for a long time and i'm not going to tell you all the details but i do remember him saying this line this is hurting me more I don't know why he said that, because that had to be a lie. But I remember on this occasion, after he finished giving me my spanking, amen, my corporal punishment, my father immediately began to put his belt on, and he said, son, come on, we've got to go. And at that, I said, we were going. <laughs> he said, son, I said, come on, we got to go. He said, we got to go, we're going to go get some ice cream. And I said in the moment, I don't want no ice cream. It just didn't seem to add up, because he had just corrected me he had just disciplined me and now he was taking me to get some ice cream and in a very real sense that's what's happening in the text because if you understand the old testament prophets then look deacon davis you understand that god always connects correction and comfort you understand that God never gives correction, Deacon Banks, without comfort. God never does not just give correction, but he always gives comfort. He always gives more comfort than he gives correction. So if you're ever experiencing the correction of God, then you can be encouraged. Oh, I see why y'all like that. Y'all trying to figure out what happened to Green Beret. Well, what happened to Green Beret is Joe Oliver said, I'm sentencing you to one night in jail. Not only am I sentencing you one night, night in jail but he got off the bench he took his, his vest off he took his robe off and he said you and I are going to stay in the same jail cell tonight I'm a veteran too and I understand what you're going through it made the news because the judge didn't just give correction but he also gave comfort and that's what God does in your life and my life no matter how dark the situation no matter how difficult the situation God says I may have to give some correction but even in my correction I'm going to give comfort I'm not going to leave you nor forsake you I'm going to bless you through this can I talk to you about your dark moments in life you will go through some dark moments in life but God says I am with you and then we get the thesis of the text then we get the main thought of the text and I just want to put it out there for you it's that God is going to do a new thing yeah God says don't hold on to the old things don't look at the circumstances don't just focus on your feelings but know that God says I'm gonna do something new it really is not a question but it invites participation God is saying can I do something new in you yeah like dr seuss god is trying to lay down this rhyme to say he wants our participation in the revelation that god has something good for us but he wants us to participate in it god says i'm going to do more than you can expect i'm going to do more than you can imagine i'm going to do more than you can believe i'm going to do something new in you i know i'm in the text but the text is wrestling with us the text is wrestling because because it first starts off with the reality that it's difficult, it's difficult to let go of the past. But the reality is, come here, come here, come here. Unless you let go of the past, you can't embrace. Somebody got that. Okay, okay.
Okay, I'm a deep theologian, so let me make it plain. My little girl, Grace, was on the monkey bars. She was on the monkey bars. And I remember she was young on the monkey bars. And she was stuck. I mean, she was stuck on the first two. She was stuck on the first two. And I was thinking to myself, hey, look, honey, you, you, you got to move on. You just can't sit right there. She said, Daddy, Daddy, come get me. She said, I'm stuck. I said, you're not stuck, baby. She said, I'm stuck like Chuck. Come get me. I said, you're not stuck. She said, well, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I said, the only problem is if you're going to reach for the next rung, you got to let go of the past rung. There's no way you can get a new rung holding on to the let, amen. And all I'm trying to say is, God says to us, it's our human nature. Our minds work in such a way where our memories can be more vivid than the moment. And if we're not careful, our memory will romanticize what happened in the past. And because our memory is romanticizing what happened in the past, we refuse to see the opportunity in the future. And so what God is trying to say is, look, I've got something good for you, but you've got to let go of the past. Now, this is hard for us to accept because look at the text. Literally, literally, Isaiah, this prophet and this poet is using poetry to talk about their redemption moment. Yeah, I'm in the Bible. He talked about going through the waters. He's literally talking about Exodus. He's talking about the enemy that followed them on chariots and horses. That this was significant because they had been a people that had been enslaved. And so the chariots and the horses, particularly the horses, represented the most powerful, those who would come and crush them, those who would punish them, those who would harm them, those who were, they were afraid of. And so he says, remember, remember how God got you to the Red Sea. But when God God got you to the Red Sea. He allowed the enemy to come after you. And now they didn't know the end of the story. So they're upset standing at the Red Sea. They're wondering how in the world, God, could you let us get this far and then allow the enemy to come crush us? Oh, no, God. And then Moses stretched out his rod. And when he stretched out his rod, God did his work. And God opened, opened the sea and made dry places in, in wet lands. And all I'm trying to say is they began to cross. And then God explained what he was doing. Because once they crossed, then all of those enemies, Pharaoh, his horses, came into the center of the sea. And God closed it up. God was trying to show them, I'm large and I'm in charge. I'm still on the throne. And I can handle anything. Thing, even if you don't understand how I'm handling it. even in dark circumstances he goes back and he reminisces and I should tell you throughout this portion of Isaiah Isaiah had been saying you're blind you can't see they literally were in a dark time and all I'm trying to say is this was significant this was their redemption moment and yet God says don't remember it now wait a minute wait a minute uh, in other places, he says to remember it. Here he says, don't remember it. Now, you got to interpret the poetry because the poetry is there poetically. And it's really talking about you can remember it, but you can't let your memory of it stop you from embracing the moment you're in. You can't let your past be greater than your future. You, you, you can't let your rear view mirror be bigger than your window shield. You, you got to embrace your future, even when you don't understand it, even when you feel like it's chaos and confusion, even when you can't put all the pieces together, you got to say, I know he was faithful in the past, but that doesn't mean I'm turning back. That means I'm trusting him in the future. You got to embrace the future. And so, and so if, okay, okay, y'all not feeling me. Let me give you some theology because you have to understand the Exodus, the redemption story was the equivalent in many ways to Calvary. It was their cross. It was them being set free from slavery. So just like we're getting ready to share communion, incidentally, communion looks at the cross and it looks at the exodus. Because before they went on the exodus, they had communion. Amen. And, and so it looks at both because it was so significant. And he says, although that is so significant, you can't hold on to it. You got to look forward. Your faith has to be forward looking. You got to move forward. You got to face forward. You got to believe the future is better than the past. The future is bigger than the past. That what God has in store for you is greater than what he's done for you. And I know he's done a lot. We could stand here today, person after person, and come to the mic. Somebody would say, I had a heart attack, but God brought me through. Somebody would say, I went bankrupt, but God brought me through. Somebody would say, 
this and somebody would say that that'd be our testimony and while that's powerful the blood is in the future the testimony is significant but your future is bigger look shadow your future is brighter god's got something in store amen so first he says look you have gotta let go of holding on to the past there's somebody here and look you, you're getting ready to get married you're getting ready to get married but somehow you holding on to the past you you're thinking about this amen you gotta watch out you think about this and think about that can i confess that this is gonna give me in trouble but i just want to confess amen look i remember when i first got married yeah my, my wife she ooh, she can cook but i remember her pancakes wasn't like my mama's pancakes because my mama would put so much oil in the pan that the outside of the pancake would be crispy because the, just the circle would be crispy because she basically fried the outside but my wife didn't do that and i remember saying to my wife one day look baby if you're gonna cook these pancakes right that was the last time I said anything like that to her. I learned to love, amen, the blessing that God had in my future. All I'm trying to say to you is some of us, we're holding on to the past so tight. We can't let it go. We're going to hold on to the past. And God says, don't hold on to that past miracle so tight that you can't embrace the miracle in front of you. Because I'm a God of new things. I've got new in store for you. I've got new in front of you. I've got better. I'll give you one more because some of y'all still not feeling this. Look, I'm the youngest child and I have an older brother and my older brother had swagger. I mean, he was cool. He had a job so he bought his own clothes and I remember that I loved to get his hand-me-downs. Boy, I'd have some nice hand-me-downs. I'd be rocking them shoes and rocking. And I remember my dad said, you can't wear his shoes anymore. Let's go buy you some shoes. I was so disappointed until I got some new shoes. And all I'm trying to say is what God rebuked the devil and listen, amen. All I'm trying to say is what God has for you is better than the hand-me-downs we're holding on to. God is a God of new things. So the text literally says that if we're going to get what God has for us, then we've got to let go of the old. I am going to do a new thing. Now let me give you this because in the text is a guarantee. Now, oftentimes I talk about the premise and the promise and what we have to do to embrace the promise. But let me tell you, this promise comes whether you embrace it or not. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not, whether you assent to it or not, God says, I'm doing a new thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So you can walk up into the grocery store and refuse to use the chip if you don't want to. Amen. You can try to hold on to your old flip cell phone. Yeah, but after a while, God says, I'm doing a new thing. We won't even service that old package. God says, I've got something new and you have to accept it. God gives a guarantee. Now, wait a minute. Don't be upset because this emphatic guarantee is to do something miraculous. Point two. This emphatic guarantee, the new thing God is going to do is going to be greater. It's going to be emphatically blessed. Can I show you in the text? God says, look, God in the text, I'm in the text. He says, I'll make rivers in the desert. Okay, okay, some of us are logical, some of us are not. But for those who are logical, you understand the problem with rivers in the desert. Because it, 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 you understand, do you understand the problem with a river in the desert? How are you going to have a river? Okay, the very definition, let me calm down. The very nature of a desert is that is it's geologically dry. It does not have enough precipitation to provide for vegetation. That is why it's a, thank you, desert. But God says, look, in your desert, I'm going to hook you up and I'm going to help you out. I'm not just going to give you a stream, but I'm going to give you a river. What God is trying to say is, in your dark place, in your bad place, in your hurt place, in the place that you feel like is a cursed place, in a harmful place, God says, I'm going to bless you so good that you're going to raise your hands and stomp your feet. That you're going to say, God, I didn't see it coming, but it's all God and it's all good. God, I didn't know you were going to do it, but it's real good and I'm real glad. God, God knows how to bless you bigger than you can imagine and bigger than you can anticipate. And so he says, I'm going to do something miraculous. In the wilderness, I'll make a path. 
Okay, in the wilderness, it's often a place you easily get confounded and lost because there's no path. It's just crowded with all these trees and all these dangers and all these things. But God says, I'll make your path smooth and I'll make your path straight. You won't be confounded. You won't be confused. But you'll know exactly where to go. Amen. Okay, y'all not feeling me. I'm a fan of football. We're getting ready to start the football season. And look, when I was in high school, although I rolled the pine most of the time, I was a running back. Uh, I'm in the Bible. I'm let me make a play. And I remember one year we had this strong line. We had a line that was so significant that literally I remember in practice thinking we're going to be successful. I remember one time getting the ball and I literally I remember running. Right. And what happened is they created a path through the they created a path through the opponents. So much so that the enemy that the opponents didn't even touch me. I got in without getting touched because there was a path through the enemy. There was a path through the opponents. And God is saying, don't worry about who's in front of you. Don't worry about who's getting on top of you. Don't worry who's trying to crush you. I'm making a path in the wilderness. All you got to do is walk. All you got to do is walk by faith and I'll make a path in the wilderness and I will give you rivers in the desert. He doesn't say water. He doesn't say a drink. He says rivers in the desert. You know, you can swim in the, river, in the river. You know, you can dive in the river. You know, you can get in the river in a dry place. God will say, I'll make it overflow with water. He says, I'm going to do something miraculous. Y'all not feeling me? Okay. One of my members, one of our members told me this. Look, he and his wife were praying. They were praying, God, we want to send our children to a particular private school. God, we want to send our children to a particular private school. But the money was tight and the change was strange. They were broke. They were borrowing from Peter to pay Paul and Bartholomew. I mean, they were broke. And look, look, suddenly, look, the father got a notice that he was going to be dismissed from his job. He was going to be early retired from his job. And so his pay would go down. That wouldn't help them get their kids in school. God, I thought you were going to do something. God, we've been praying and asking. We've been seeking you and calling on you. We've been looking to you with a heavy heart and a broken heart, tears in our eyes. We've been earnestly asking. And here you do this. And look, he literally lost his job. He got his pension. He's got his payment, but he lost his job. So he had to go look for another job. While he was looking for another job, his old job called him and said, we'd like to hire you as a contractor. We will pay you what we were paying you before. Wait, wait, you'll miss it if you don't hold up. And think about it. He was getting his retirement. He was getting his pension. He was getting all that was due him. Plus, he was getting paid for doing the job that he was doing because God knows how to hook the brother up. Amen. I'm sorry for saying that. God knows how to handle situations by surprise. God is holy Houdini. He can go boom, bang, wow. And you'll say, God, how'd you do it? He doesn't have to tell us how he's going to do it, but he will do it. He says, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, not you, not your neighbor, not your friends, not your spouse, not them or him or her. I'm going to do it. And when God says he's going to do something, you can be assured God will get it done. God said, this one's on me, baby. I'm going to do a new thing. Okay. Okay, okay, I, I understand, I see, I see. Now, now here's the, the hard part for you, okay? Here's the hard part for you and for me, okay? Look, so sorry, this, this is the hard part. Look, look, because he says, can you not perceive it? So regardless, he's going to do it. But he invites us to participate in it. Why? Why, why is he about it? Okay, all right, all right. Why, why? Okay, because, because, look, let me show you. Because God says, if it's a dark place and you perceive it, then you will trust me and you'll have hope in your darkness. Okay, all right, okay, okay. okay. Lord, please, you got to make this plain. God says, look, the word perceive literally means to taste. It means to taste it. I don't know if you've ever been sitting in the kitchen waiting, sitting on a restaurant waiting. And while you are waiting, you hungry and you get hangry. That's angry and hungry. You get hangry while you're waiting for the food. But as you wait for the food, you begin to taste it in your mind. You begin to taste it in your heart. And it really changes your disposition because, you know, the food is going to be mm -mm good. 
And God says, although I cannot explain it, although I cannot fully understand it, although I cannot detail to you how the contours of the future will be, I can say that the future will be so grand and be so great. It will be so blessed that you'll sit down in anticipation. And God is trying to say, instead of pacing the floor, angry, upset, you can sit down in anticipation. And God will bless the future in such a way where you can say, I saw it coming. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm reading a book called Uncommon. It's a book called Uncommon. It tells and is by Tony Dungy. And Tony Dungy opens up in chapter one, chapter one, explaining how he was fired from the Buccaneers. And he talks about how difficult it was. The Buccaneers, he had moved them from a last place team to a progressive team. They had gone and seen success after success. And so he was so anticipating the future. And so he was so disappointed with God. He says that as he came out of his office and, and the Bucks Center one really at 1 a.m. He was hoping not to see anybody. The reporters rushed him, putting a camera all up in his face. There he is. Look at him. But look, if you know the story of Tony Dungy, the book opens with Buccaneers. Yeah. But the book ends with the Colts. And he won the championship with the Colts. And in winning the championship, he established multiple African American coaches throughout the league. It was so significant from the seeds that were sown. And the blessing was so big that he couldn't have anticipated or expected, but it happened just like God said it would happen because God said it will happen. It will happen. It will come to pass. Okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. Uh, so God requires we let go of past things. Good things, bad things. Got to let go. God guarantees our future. In the text, it's specifically speaking to the Babylonians who would come and take them captive. How can you celebrate the Babylonians come and taking them captive? But God said, I'm going to use a bad thing to do a good thing. But then he says, not only God requires we let go of the past, God guarantees the new work, the new thing. God calls us to perceive it. When we perceive it, our peace will be assurance. Our peace will be confident. Our peace, okay, okay, oh, Lord, help me. Uh, so, so in my house, uh, they're, they're different season. One, one of my sons said to me, he said, Dad, I've gotten to the place where I don't need the nightlight anymore. I mean, this was a big deal. I get to save money on a nightlight. Amen. This was a big deal because he always needed a light in the dark. But do you know you can get to a place when you don't need a light in the dark? Do you know you can get to a place where even when it's dark, you have the confidence that it's the same environment that it was when it was light. In fact, you can see it in your spirit. You can see it in your mind. Okay, uh, okay, oh, okay. Let, let, me, let me say the Bible. Let me say the Bible. Uh, because the text says this. It says, verse 20. Check it out. I'm in the Bible. The wild animals will honor, another way. The wild animals will praise, another way. The wild animals will worship me. The jackals and the owls. Now, this is poetry. So Isaiah is not wasting words. I had to do a study on the jackals, wolves, jackals, the types of, uh, of animal, wolf, jackal, and, and the owls. And I discovered that they literally really only had three major things in common. First, first, here it is, they're nocturnal. Somebody might get this, somebody might not. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're nocturnal, which is they do the majority of what they do at night. Okay, okay, but not only are they nocturnal, but they're scoptic. Okay, all right, let me explain. Scoptic means that they see in the dark. Yeah, they have the uncanny capacity to see in the dark. And literally, lastly, the owl and the jackals, they sing out. Woo! Jackal, or woo, 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 woo. In the dark. When things are dark, they still functioning. When things are dark, they see. When things are dark, they call out. And I had to begin to think about that. that God said through Isaiah, that I'll let you get to the place that in your darkest hour, you'll be able to see a future. In your darkest space, you'll be able to know what's coming. In your darkest place, you'll be able to see something, something brighter than the daytime. And others will say, but it's dark. I can't make it, but I'm sick. I can't go on, but I don't have money. But look, I see it. I see it. You'll be able to tell everybody else, I see 
something in the future. I see something bigger. I see something better. And consequently, I got to cross. Hallelujah. 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 God will let you go in dark places and have the peace and assurance of the light. God will let you be skeptic and nocturnal. God says, don't fear. Don't be afraid. Take my peace and take my joy and walk on with your bad self, even in dark places. Hallelujah. And praise God. I, I don't know what dark place you might have to go through, but I know God will get you through. He'll let you see something brighter. He'll let you see something bigger. He'll let you see something better because God we're standing to our feet we're standing to our feet hallelujah the gospel has been preached can you not see it that God wants to do something new in you even in the darkness even in the difficulty you have to decide to perceive it to believe God enough. Oh, yeah. To believe God enough. Yeah. Yeah. Your will and to your way. Your spirit speaks to me. With? With my whole heart I'll agree. And my answer.